Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. This is the verse that I had. We'll turn to Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. And we will, it's, we will use that as a springboard. We're definitely going in a different direction than Brother Manuel did, but this is a verse I want to start with. I do want us to continue to pray for, um, continue to pray for my father, and uh, God would bless, be with him, strengthen him. He's uh, finishing up a, a stint in Louisiana. I was preaching at brother uh, at a camp meeting there, and then tonight I believe is in the New Orleans area with brother uh, Otto Martin. And uh, so we want to pray that God would uh, bless. And be with him in a mighty way. Amen. So thankful for all of our guests that are here tonight. Thank you for being here. And we're just believing the Lord to do something beautiful in your life. Amen. We would encourage, if you could, come back this Sunday. And we're going to have a great time in the Holy Ghost. Bishop Booker is going to be preaching a couple of times. And so we're looking forward to that. And uh, let's be praying that God would bless uh, the, the weekend services as well as the Spanish services as well as the uh, youth conference Thursday and Friday. And uh, thank you for all of your prayers. Amen. The book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse number 8. And the Bible says, but ye shall receive power. Everybody say power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And I'm going to use this verse just as an intro as I talk about uh, the lesson that we want to talk about tonight. And uh, I want to continue in lesson number eight of what a difference a line can make. And if you guys want to switch over uh, to that, we will we'll do that. Now let's pray and let's just ask that God would have his way in this place tonight. Would you help me pray? Jesus, we love you. And God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your mercy and your love. And we ask that you would bless your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. Before you're seated, find someone, shake their hand, greet them in Jesus' name. Amen. How many are glad to be a part of the kingdom of God? Amen. We are blessed to be a part of the church. And as Brother Manuel mentioned tonight, I'm glad that I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I've got the Spirit. And, uh, you know, the, the church that we are a part of, the kingdom of God, um, if it were a business... And it's not, I mean, I guess you could say we're in the people business, but if it were a business, it'd be safe to say that uh, the church has the greatest product in the world, and that is the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anybody glad for the gospel that saved us? Amen. And if the church was a business, we could say that we have the greatest mission of any business in the world. We are asked to be witnesses of the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. If the church was a business, we, as we read in Acts 1 and 8, we are the greatest market share in the world. And when Jesus said to go and preach, he said, you go and you start in Jerusalem, and then you go into Judea, and then from there into Samaria... And then you go into the uttermost part of the earth. And so, I'm going to just tell you, it's an honor to be a part of the kingdom of God. We are his ambassadors. I'm glad to be his emissary. I'm glad to be what our text said tonight, a witness of the Holy Ghost. We are preaching the most beautiful, glorious gospel in all the world. Aren't you thankful to be a part of the kingdom of God tonight? Amen. And I'll tell you... I'll do anything, I'll do anything to be effective in the kingdom of God. I'll do anything to be effective. Biblically, that's correct, I'll do anything. Uh, I don't think there's any sacrifice that's too great to make. I don't think there's, there's any uh, thing God could ask us to do that would be too much. I want to be a part of spreading this gospel around the world. Can you say amen? Now, we want to talk about, 
and we are now on lesson number eight. What a difference a line can make. And, uh, and, and so with that introduction, I'm going to make something of a, an awkward segue into our topic tonight. But this is what I want to talk about, and it will, we'll come back around to this. And we want to go to lesson number eight, and I want to talk about uh, this subject, facial hair on men. Facial hair on men. And I want to talk specifically about what does the Bible say about facial hair on men. Now, we, we've talked, we went through in this, this uh, series of what a difference a line can make. We've talked about modesty. We've talked about modest apparel. Uh, we've taken time to talk about adornments. We talked uh, last Wednesday, I believe it was, about 1 Corinthians 11 and the subject of men and women's hair. And I want to talk tonight on this subject and specifically what is the biblical stance on facial hair on men. Now, I want to be very open and I want to be very honest with you I, as, I, as I go through this tonight. And uh, I want to begin by telling you that, that in your Bible you will find that many men in the Bible had facial hair. Many men in the Bible wore beards. And uh, I will just give you a, a bunch of these to begin this lesson tonight. First of all, uh, in the book of Leviticus, Moses spends uh, some scripture uh, space there dealing with the fact that uh, if, if a man had a beard, they were not to, <coughs> excuse me, they were not to uh, trim the corners of the beards. There was specific discussion about that. And obviously the uh, implication is that they wore beards. You can read in Psalm 133, a beautiful psalm about unity, but it makes reference to Aaron's beard. Uh, 2 Samuel 10, verses 4 through 5, we read a, uh, an interesting story where David sends um, some of his men to comfort uh, a man by the name of Hanan, the Ammonite, upon the death of his father. And when they went, the, the Ammonites, in, for whatever reason, in retaliation, instead of being thankful, they took these men, they humiliated them, they... <clears throat> they, they they uh, cut their clothes in half and sent them, sent them home pretty much half naked. And the other part they did was they, they cut half their beards off of their face and sent them home. Um, and, so, and so it was, again, just to humiliate them. But again, revealing they had beards. Quickly, we'll read about Amasa, the, the captain of David's host. Very briefly, the captain of David's host. And uh, he had a beard. We read about Mephibosheth, 2 Samuel 19, 24, the same. Ezra, in Ezra chapter 9, verse 3, this is kind of interesting. He was a, a, a priest, a leader of Israel. And the Bible says that when uh, another guy in the time of, of, roughly around the time of Ezra was Nehemiah, at least during the, and uh, Nehemiah, they also, uh, he was a leader of God's people. They both at times got frustrated. Imagine that, a leader of God's people getting frustrated. Well, the Bible says that when Nehemiah got mad at the people of God, he got so mad he grabbed the people's hair and he began to pull it out. That's what the Bible says. Ezra got so mad he pulled out his own hair, the Bible says, and, uh, and, and actually pulled out part of his beard. He was just so upset. And uh, so you see that Ezra had a beard. You read where Ezekiel, Ezekiel 5 and 1 had a beard. And this is where the Bible actually tells Ezekiel uh, just a crazy story. He said, Ezekiel, I want you to shave your beard into three parts. Cut it off and spread it and split it up into three parts. Take a third of it and burn it in the fire. So he does. And then a third of it, I want you to take a knife. And I want you to beat a little pile of your, the hair of your face. And so he does. And then the third one he takes and, and, and God says, let that part of your beard blow in the wind. And all of this was a, a, a metaphor of what was going to happen to the people of God for their disobedience to God. Again, whatever else you get out of that, we know Ezekiel had a beard, at least for a while. Uh, even very likely, Jesus Christ had a beard. And uh, I often, though, for the fun of it, will, will ask people, I'll give you a thousand bucks if you can show me where in the New Testament Jesus had a beard. And the reason for that is it doesn't say in the New Testament that he did. It prophesies in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 50, verse number 6, that they would pluck the beard from his face. It's part of the part of the things that would happen at Calvary. And so very likely, of course, 
that prophecy is applying to Jesus and he had a beard. All of that is to say the biblical stance on facial hair, it, it's really an argument from silence. And I want to, I think it's very important that, that we come at it uh, from that standpoint and we are honest about that. Now, having said that, I do want you to know that the apostolic Pentecostal church with which we are affiliated has in the main for the last several decades been opposed to facial hair, to beards and mustaches on men. Now, now where did that come from? This stand basically originated um, around the time of, of the two main movements, the beatniks in the 50s and 60s. And then the hippie movement in the 60s and 70s. And there was, during that time, just a lot of stuff going on with that. And so the church, in an effort to just kind of combat that spirit, began to teach and preach against that. And so, uh, for the remainder of this lesson, I want to I express to you the reasons why we feel like this is a stance that is best for us, for men not to have facial hair. So I want to begin, and I want to begin with a very important Bible concept. And Brother Adam, if you have Mark chapter 8, verse 35, I want to talk about this. The idea of doing things for the sake of the gospel. Everybody say, for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. Now, there are some things, as Brother Manuel was preaching, we, he was talking about this treasure in earthen vessels. And the text that I use tonight, that, that I, it's because it's dealing with the idea of the gospel and the gospel being spread. And I want to tell you that this gospel is a beautiful thing. Is there anybody that can just say, I am a different person because of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. A lot of you may not know the testimonies that are sitting on this pew of people that used uh, to be so many different things. There's people here that were bound by drugs, but God delivered them from drugs. I had a man just today text me, I believe it was today, about and sent me a picture of a prison that he used to be in several years ago. But he walked out, and just a few years later, God put him in this church. He's one of the greatest men in this church today, a blessing in the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you, the gospel works. There is power in repentance power in baptism. There is power in the spirit of God that's in these earthen vessels. Anybody glad for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. And I, I'm going to tell you, for the sake of something that precious, I'm willing to do things for the sake of the gospel. I am willing to make some sacrifices. There's some things I'm willing to refrain from. Now, this is a Bible concept. Brother Adam, I would, I'd like you to read in Mark 8 and 35, and then Brother Gavin in just a moment from Mark chapter 10. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Jesus gives an incredible truth. He says, whoever will save his life, you got to first lose your life. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. The reverse is also true. But he makes this statement, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake. Everybody say, for Jesus' sake. And then he says, and the gospel's sake. There is, he's referring to Jesus' sake and the gospel's sake. I'm going to tell you, some things we do for the sake of Jesus. There are some things that he says, that troubles me. There are some things he says, this is my nature, and it never changes throughout culture. It never changes throughout time. I am Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and this is how I feel about it. The Bible says, for instance, that God hates a proud look. I want to tell you, God has hated a proud look since the beginning of time. And he will hate a proud look uh, until the end of time. He never changes. I don't want to have a proud look for the sake of Jesus. I want to please him. But I'm going to tell you, there are other things that we do that are done for the sake of being effective in spreading the gospel. Verse, uh, Mark chapter 10, brother, uh, brother Gavin, verse number 29. And Jesus answered and said, verily I say unto you. Verily I say unto you. There is no man that hath left house 
Okay, he begins to make this incredible statement. There is nobody that has left their house. Or brethren. He talks about a man leaving his brother. Or sisters. Or his sisters. Or father or mother. Father or mother. Or wife or children. Wife or children. Or lands. Jesus is talking about the possibility of somebody doing all of these things. What an incredible statement. Somebody leaving father, mother, sister, brother. The most close relations that a man could ever have. Even property. And he says... For my sake. For my sake. Everybody say for Jesus' sake. And? And the gospel. And the gospels. Now I'm going to tell you, there is a time that, 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 that being close to Jesus and for the sake of Jesus that we, we may have to leave some things behind. There are things that for the sake of Jesus and who he is that we have to leave things behind. But Jesus also makes it clear there are some things that in being effective in spreading the gospel, we may have to leave behind. And I believe I'm not making a distinction that's not there. Jesus says for my sake and the gospel's sake. There is a difference between what we do sometimes for his sake and what we simply do for the sake of the gospel. Some things I'm willing to do just so I can be more effective in spreading the gospel. And my prayer is, in the Lighthouse Church, let this get in us. God, give us this kind of a heart that says, Lord, whatever we can do, that we can be more effective to reach more people in more places, to do the work of God in accordance to the word of God, to see the gospel of Jesus Christ and this treasure in an earthen vessel be spread in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth i'm willing to do anything for the sake of the gospel of jesus christ amen and so there is a principle here for the sake of the gospel now an an interesting example of this is found of somebody doing something for the sake of the gospel is found in acts chapter number 15 and acts chapter 16 if you have your bibles you might just want to turn there we'll we'll kind of move through here really quickly Amen. <clears throat> now, I, I kind of took a few minutes uh, in one of our lessons to discuss Acts chapter number 15. Acts chapter number 15 is a fascinating time in the early church. It's when uh, there was a group called what we refer to as the Judaizers. These were people that as the gospel was spreading to the Gentiles, they would come behind apostles like Paul and they would begin to say, that these new converts that had received the Holy Ghost, that they needed to be circumcised just like the Old Testament law dictated. They needed to be circumcised. And, and other elements of the law were necessary. Now, you don't have to know very much about your Bible to know this was something that drove Paul absolutely crazy. In fact, the book of Galatians, if you read the book of Galatians, He gets furious. He makes statements that are mind-boggling about how angry he was at these people that were insisting that Gentiles be circumcised. Well, in Acts 15, this came to a head. These people had been following him around. And in Acts chapter number 15, the Bible lets us know that, uh, that there was kind of a council at Jerusalem. And... Uh, the Judaizers were apparently were there. The apostle Paul, uh, was there. Silas were there, was there. And the apostles were gathered together there. And they begin to talk about this. What is necessary for Gentiles? Do they need to be circumcised? And it was decreed. There was a law that was given basically, uh, that they did not need to be circumcised. These Gentiles had received the Holy Ghost. And the the apostles make this fascinating statement. They say that it seemed good to us and to the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you, that's a good combination. When the ministry, the Holy Ghost, and the Word come together, it seemed good to us and to the the Holy Ghost. And and they made this this list of things. They were to abstain from things strangled, from blood, from adultery, uh, things offered to idols, etc. And then... They sent Paul, Silas, and Judas uh, with letters to the different churches to let them know the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. Everybody say, they did not. 
You got it? They did not have to be circumcised. In fact, it's very evident. We read in Colossians chapter 2 that baptism was, uh, baptism was the, the idea of being uh, the New Testament version of circumcision made without hands. You can read it in Colossians 2, 10 through 11. Now, something amazing happens though. They leave directly from that council where they say they do not have to be circumcised. And in chapter number 16, brother Adam, are you there? Let's read in Acts chapter number 16 about a young man by the name of Timothy or Timotheus. Verse 1. Then came he to Derby and to Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed. But his father was a Greek. Now I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, Timothy, this is where we first read about Timothy, the books of First and Second Timothy that Paul would later write. Timothy is such a big player in Paul's life. One of his young men that would be, uh, you know, just, just one of his, uh, somebody who was very much proud of, a protege of Paul. The Bible says that his mother was a Jew and his father was a Gentile. Now, this is interesting. Paul's going to take him on a missionary journey. They had just left Acts 15, the Jerusalem council, where they made the idea they do not need to be circumcised. And in verse number three of Acts chapter 16, the Bible says, that, well, let me tell you this. I'll just tell you. You don't need to read it, Brother Adam. Paul calls Timothy. says, hey, bud, come here. I want to talk to you. I can see Timothy running over and, yes, sir. And um, you want to go on a missionary journey? Sir, I would love to go with you. You want to do the work of God? Yes. You want to be a missionary? I'd love to be a missionary. You want the gospel to be a, a spread around the world effectively? And Timothy's just about to run the aisles. Yes, sir. I want you to do something for me. And Timothy says, sir, I will do anything for the gospel. And Paul looks at him and says, I want you, this grown man, to be circumcised. Now, I can only imagine what went through Timothy's mind. But the bottom line is the Bible says that he did it. And this is why I want you to read in verse number three, why Timothy was circumcised. Him would Paul have go forth with him. He wanted him to go with him. He took him and circumcised him. And here is why. Because of the Jews, which were in those quarters. He said, because there are Jews in these quarters and For they knew all that his father was a Greek. They knew his dad was a Gentile. And they were going to use this as an excuse to not receive the gospel. They were going to use this as an excuse to stir things up and say, don't listen to him. Don't don't listen to Paul. Don't listen to Timothy. He's not even circumcised. And Paul said, listen, Timothy, I know you don't have to be circumcised. I just got out of a council where they said you don't have to. But I'm going to tell you, for the sake of... Of the gospel, you need to be circumcised. Now here, I want you to listen. Was Timothy circumcised for the sake of of Jesus? I don't believe that. The Bible says it didn't need to be circumcised. Was Timothy circumcised for his own sake? Certainly not. He had already been baptized in Jesus' name. That was the New Testament covenant of circumcision. Buried with him in baptism. He didn't do it for Jesus' sake. He did not do it for his own sake. But Timothy simply said, for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm willing to do it. Now, I want to tell you, church, we are living in the United States of America. And it's an entirely different society. It's an entirely different world. And the world we're living in, it's, it's, it's different. We don't live in the Mideast or somewhere like that. And, and I, I would say this. This is, this is probably a good way of putting it. Not everyone in the world in our world, in our Western world, is comfortable with men having facial hair. But almost no one minds a man that is clean-shaven. Now, I want to be very honest with you. I do not believe that having a beard is a sin. But I do wonder, and I do feel, it could be a stumbling block to somebody. And, And some people might say, but Jesus had a beard. And I would say, yes, but it would probably be a stumbling block to dress like Jesus, too. You know Jesus wore a robe, and if I walked around town, and I've seen people do it, wearing robes, and wearing, and they're carrying a sign, the end of the world is coming, and everybody looks at them like they're a Fruit Loop, right? 
I'm going to tell you, we got enough stuff in that Bible that's, that's confrontational without inventing stuff. And for us to go around in robes, or, uh, and there's other examples I could use. Uh, and, and I'm going to just tell you, just for the sake of the gospel, I believe it's a safe place to be and to teach. And that's what we ask. And a good question to ask is this. Timothy, if he was here, he'd probably ask it. Which is easier for a man to do? Be circumcised for the sake of the gospel or shave your face? <laughs> I'll shave any day of the week. And all the men said, amen. 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 Now, I want to continue with this. And I will not not be real long tonight. I don't think I'll even go till 9 o'clock. But a question that we might ask is, uh, let's see here. Can we or should we, could or should the church set a standard that is not specifically detailed in Scripture? Now, I don't mean something that is anti-biblical. Obviously not. But a good question to ask is, can a, the church set a standard like this? Or even should a church set a standard like this? And I want to just take a moment. Did you know that companies have dress standards? Anybody ever been to Magic Mountain? Okay, I haven't in a long time. And I would die happy if I never go again. Not because it's a bad place. I'm just old, okay? And all the young people, are, they like it, okay? But, but Magic Mountain has a dress code. I think this is still their current one. If it wasn't, it's, it's, it was relatively current. This is part of their dress code. I'm going to just go through it real quick. They say this. In keeping with our family-friendly environment and for safety reasons, Six Flags enforces a dress code. Okay? This is it. Proper attire must be worn in the park at all time. Includes shirts and appropriate footwear. Clothing or tattoos with offensive language or graphics are not permitted at any time. And examples of clothing not permitted are those displaying profanity, Magic Mountain actually has a dress code that says you cannot have a shirt that has pornography. You cannot have a shirt that has graphic violence or gang symbols. Or, and somebody might white work, you know, go in there with a, a shirt with you know, drugs on it and, they, and, and say, this is just a shirt. Magic Mountain, who are you to tell me how to dress? And Magic Mountain will say, you can do anything you want, but go to Knott's Berry Farm and see if they let you in. They, they have rules. They can't wear anything uh, promoting discrimination against any group, etc. Uh, did you know Disneyland has uh, uh, a dress standard? They, this is part of their deal. They say you cannot wear... Uh, I, I remember being in the car. You can't even wear costumes uh, by guests 14 years and older. And I imagine that has to do with safety. Cannot wear masks uh, if your age is 14 uh, or older, unless they're for medical purposes. You cannot wear clothing with objectionable material, including obscene languages. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all this. The point is, Disneyland has standards. In fact, I heard about a recent company in California. It was a security company. And the new CEO took over. And uh, he set this standard. It was, he had a no facial hair, no beard policy for his security guards. And... Uh, there was a young a man that worked there. He had had a goatee for years. He refused to shave. This man, the new CEO, fired him. So this, the guy, the security guard, sued, saying, I have a constitutional right to express myself through facial hair. This is how I express myself. And the result was, and this is what the, the article said, was Joseph had a bad hair day in court. As the judges threw out his complaint, they said this, there's different rules that apply in the public sector where under some circumstances, a man's facial hair could be his expression of uh, political expression, but no such right exists for private sector workers. Okay. Point being companies set standards. Did you know the government set standards? Did you know that generally this probably won't surprise you, but in America, generally nudity in is against the law in public spaces. Even if you do, you want to be naked in your backyard, but your neighbor can see it, there's actually laws on the books against this. And so here's the deal. Companies can set standards. And the government can set standards in order to more effectively accomplish their mission. Then why in the world, if that's the case, should not the church of God, God's designated standard bearer of truth, of morality, of righteousness, have the right to set a standard in the church. 
and, and some things obviously are detailed in scripture. First Corinthians chapter 11. I'm very honest. You know this. I'm telling you in the Bible, it does not say don't do this, but we teach it because here's the deal. I believe the mission of the church is more effectively advanced with this standard. I believe that for the sake of the gospel, there's no, no, almost nobody anywhere in the U S is offended by a smooth shaven man. And at the end of the day, this is where we're at. I believe God's people and God's church has the right to set a standard. Anybody interested in being effective in preaching and teaching and reaching our world. Amen. And everybody said, amen. Now I want to use Another example here. The example of Jacob the patriarch. This is Abraham's grandson. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And the spotted and speckled cattle. The spotted and speckled herds. There's an amazing thing that happens in the book of Genesis chapter number 30. For sake of time, I'm going to just tell you the story. Um, Now, Jacob was quite a guy, right? He's a wheeler dealer. And he's got this streak of dishonesty early on in life. And, uh, and God says, I know how to fix you. And can I tell you, God does know how to fix us. He will find ways. He'll give us a boss. He'll give us, in this case, a father-in-law that will help you with your problem. And the Bible says that Jacob began to work with the father-in-law. And the father-in-law would rip him off over and over and over again. And finally, uh, he would change his wages when he would see that it was working to Jacob's advantage. Finally, the Bible says that he does it again to Jacob and and he says, let's negotiate our wages again. What shall I give you for your work? And Jacob makes this ridiculous statement. It would be ridiculous, except if you read in the next chapter, chapter 31, apparently God had given him a dream. And can I tell you, if God gives you a dream uh, and you know it's from God, you can act safely on it. Jacob looks at his father-in-law Laban and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to give me all of the calves, all of the goats that are speckled and spotted. spotted. Okay? Uh, all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats of such shall be my hire. And, and he says, that's the ones I get. You, and, and just to, I'm kind of oversimplifying, but basically I get the spotted ones. You get the ones that are all plain. Okay? And, uh, and so Laban looks at the cattle and there's a lot more that are plain, you know, plain, whatever. And he says, no, no problem. We'll do it. Man, it's nice having a stupid son-in-law to work with. And so they go for it. They shake hands. Well, what began to happen, the Bible says that Jacob then goes out and he takes a bunch of uh, branches from trees and he begins to peel them. This is a weird story. It's bizarre. He begins to peel it and, and, and notch out spots on it. Until he got done, he had a, a tree branch that was spotted and speckled. And he took it and he put the rods. The Bible says in verse 38, he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks at the place where they would come to drink. So the, the animals would come up and they would, that's where they would drink. And that's where they often would conceive. And the Bible says that these animals begin to have babies that looked just like those, those spotted and speckled staves, staves. They began to have animal babies that were spotted and speckled, what, like what that was set in front of them. And then Jacob does another thing. He separates the lambs and he kept the ones that were his. And he would kind of, he, he, would, he would set it so that not only were they seeing those staves, but they were seeing other spotted and speckled ones. And when they would have babies, overwhelmingly, They begin to have babies that were spotted and speckled. Now, what is this weird story supposed to teach us? We do know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's an application here. I'm going to tell you, this is the application. What was set before the flock when it was time to drink and it was time to conceive is what they produced. And I want to tell this church, this is a principle with God. What is set in front of the flock when they are eating, you're eating right now, when you are drinking, what God's spirit is moving, when, when, when that's when I'll tell you when conception happens, it happens when the word is applied, it happens in the altar when the Holy Ghost comes and what is set in front of you is what we will have more of. 
I, I'm telling you, if we have a choir that is full of worldliness, it will produce worldliness in the pew. If we have a choir that is full of women with cut hair, it will produce that in the pew. If we have a choir that is full, if you have preachers up here that are not, uh, you know, being in accordance to the word of God, there is something, a spiritual principle that happens. But I'm going to tell you on the other end of that, you get spiritual people in the choir, you're going to have spiritual people in the pew. Thank God for people in the choir that know how to lift their hands and worship God. Can I just preach to the choir for a moment? Keep on praising God. Keep on lifting up your voice. Keep on coming to choir practice. Is that good, Sister Sarah? Keep on shouting. Sister Jana, keep on leading them in in the music department to to be righteous in God. You know, we're going to end up with a bunch of worshipers in the pew. We're going to end up with a bunch of other young people that, that, that know how to dress right and live right. I'm going to tell you, I'm so proud of some of you young people standing in their choir, uncut hair, dresses that are modest, uh, no makeup, no ju- living for God righteously. You know what that's going to produce? Uh, more young people living for God. Come on, young men. Don't stop praising. Don't stop worshiping. Don't stop coming down on Sunday night shouting. There is a Bible principle that what is placed in front of you is what we will produce. Anybody want to see more of revival and godliness and righteousness? If you feel that way, lift your hands and thank God for it tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our voice and thank God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. And so, I do believe clean-shaven men, it's going it, it to, just, it just happens. I'll never forget Brother Dwayne Davis years ago. You may have forgot saying this, and I think it was you. But I remember when you, you had that mustache and nobody had taught on it. We don't teach on this often. I mean, it's the first time I've ever taught on it as far as a, a, a whole teaching lesson. And he hadn't heard anybody teach about it, but he came to church and he, it was gone. This is years ago when he first got in church. And I, I remember like asking him, why'd you do that? I wanted to know. Not that he wasn't supposed to, but... And he said, you know, it was just part of my old life. I just, man, I just, and you know what it was? He's just looking around and, and, and he saw what he saw and it began to be a part of who he was. I'm going to tell you, I want to be of that number that's promoting the gospel. That's doing everything I can for the sake of the gospel. I want it to be, I'm, I'm telling you, I want this gospel just, there's enough confrontation in the word of God that God inspired without giving my own confrontation. I, I want it to be powerful when I talk to others about it. Amen. I'm almost done. Musicians, come. Never forget my dad telling this story. And in fact, I, I remember this guy. My dad probably 35 years ago, 35 probably we were in Bakersfield we were evangelizing and my dad was preaching a revival for I.H. Terry I was talking to brother Bruce Davis the other day and uh, boy he's got some neat stories about brother I.H. Terry and uh, anyway brother Terry uh, was pastoring there and, and they were having a great revival and there was a man that had been coming to church for a while sitting there on the on the pew he had not received the Holy Ghost not been baptized and uh, he, he came to my dad, or my dad had a knock on the door one day. And because uh, they had the trailer that parked in the parking lot, and he opens the door, and there's this man standing there. He had a full beard, and the guy said, Hey, preacher, I've got a question. My dad says, Yes. The man's opening words are, You're just going to send me to hell. <laughs> my dad says, He says, Now who's telling you this? Because if it was Brother Terry, he was going to say, Go talk to Brother Terry, okay? And he said, no, it's, it's an old man that's, that mows the lawn. He's been telling me it's going to send me to hell. My dad said, no, I don't believe that. He said, but, but let me talk to you a little bit. He said, you, you see these houses right here uh, across the street from the church? Man turned and looked and said, yeah. He said, if, if you go and knock on those doors, there's a chance that I don't know. You knock on the door and, hey, how you doing? They open the door and, we're doing all right. What you want? And, oh, well, I want to tell you about God. And, and uh, 
So there might be somebody slam the door in your face and say, I'm not interested. And, and uh, so you just, you stand there and go down the street. Well, the lady, as she, she slams the door, she goes back inside the house and her husband says, who was that? And my dad said, her, she might tell her husband, ah, some hippie is out here peddling trash. And uh, he said, you go down the street, knock on another door. Now, if you were clean shaven, knocked on that same door, she'd probably say, how you doing? What you, you know, oh, I'm a, I go to that church right there. I'd like to tell you about it. She would probably say, I'm not interested and slam the door. But when she turned and walked inside and her husband says, who was that? She'd probably say, ah, there's some guy out there peddling trash. And she won't be able to throw off on. Praise the Lord. Oh, <sighs> battery issues. I'm trying to think whether I should pull my hair out or... No, anyway, moving right along. Just joking. My dad said after all that, he said, I'm wondering, he said, do you get the difference? They're not able to throw off on the gospel because of your appearance. The man looked at my dad and he said, and my dad kind of went through the whole Timothy story. He told out Timothy had gotten circumcised for the sake of the gospel. And my dad asked the man, he said, which is harder? Would you rather be circumcised or shaved? And the guy said, I got it. <laughs> and, he, and he said, so what you're telling me, preacher? He said, you're telling me for the sake of the gospel so I could be more effective. I, that's why we do this. You're not saying heaven or hell. You're saying, my dad said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. And, and my dad said, I could have kissed him in that moment. It just like, I, you know, when people get it so beautifully. And, and I'm going to just tell you, I, I'm almost done here. Brother Manuel, you read it, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Church, we've got the greatest product in all the world. We've got the greatest mission. We've got the biggest market share. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. It's yours. You own it. I'm going to tell you, God's doing good things around here. And I want to do anything I can to be a part of the kingdom of God. I'm going to say one more thing and then we're going to, I'm going to have you stand. But I want you to think with me. Traditions are important. Okay? Now I know there are traditions of men that impede and stand against the gospel. We're not talking about that. This is something that is effective, that helped the gospel. And I, I don't even know, I don't know if I've ever heard it said like this, but I was just thinking the other day, if there ever came a day in America where every man had a beard, it probably wouldn't be wise for us necessarily to just turn this around and, 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 and change it overnight because it would do something to consciences. You understand what I'm saying? There are people that are just, that are different churches that are pulling this one out. And I'm telling you, it's affecting them. It's affecting them because one thing is tied to another. And there's, a, and, and there's an effect that happens. And I'm telling you, it affects their fellowship as well. I don't want to be a negative impact on the churches around here by allowing something just in an effort to be, I don't know, hip and relative. I want to be effective in the kingdom of God. This ain't holding us back. Are you kidding me? <laughs> if anything, it's making us more effective. And church, we're a part of something glorious, something powerful, something universal, something all-encompassing. It's the kingdom of God. And I tell you this, pastor's telling you for the sake of the gospel, I don't want to, I'm not going to wear facial hair. We're going to keep this doctrine. It, it is, it is, it makes us more effective in the kingdom of God. Are you glad today that we're a part of something that's beautiful, something great? For the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's stand tonight. Let's stand tonight. I'd like us to lift our hands and our voice. And I want us just to talk to the Lord right now. Come on, I want us to love him all across this place. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Won't you lift your voice with me? And let's just thank God that we're a part of the kingdom of God. Come on, all across, from the front to the back. I'm done preaching, but I believe we ought to lift our voice to God and thank Him tonight. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 
I love you, Jesus. They're, they're playing this music. I'm going to just open this altar right now. If there's somebody that would say, you know, I want to be a part of this kingdom of God. I want to be a part of the gospel being spread. I want to be a part of revival moving here and there and everywhere. And I will, for the sake of the gospel, do anything that's necessary. Come on, if that's how you feel. If that's how you feel. If you're here tonight and you need the Holy Ghost, you can get the Holy Ghost tonight. If you're here tonight and you want a relationship with God, you can find that relationship with God tonight. Come on, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There is there is treasure in earthen vessels. Listen, guests, I know you may not have heard this before, but there is there's a Holy Ghost waiting for you. God wants to touch you. God wants to minister to you. Come on, as you come to this altar, won't you just lift your hands and talk to the Lord?